Welcome. I am Brandi Bynum Dawson, Senior Director of Policy and Advocacy at the North Carolina Rural Center. We're excited to host you for the second time this week in the celebration of National Small Business Week. For 35 years, the North Carolina Rural Center has been working alongside many of you to ensure our state small businesses and entrepreneurs can thrive can thrive because this work is vital to the overall health of rural communities across North Carolina. To get us started, we want to hear where you're joining from today and what small businesses you're supporting this week. Please take a moment to drop in the chat your name, organization or affiliation, where you're calling from, could be county or city, your choice, and your favorite North Carolina small business. We'll give you a moment to do that. All right, let those information come into the chat. Now, as we discussed in our session on Monday, since 2020, the North Carolina Department of the Secretary of State has reported that over 300,000 new businesses were registered. In 2021 alone, the 178,300 new business creation filings were more than double the amount registered four years prior. Again, this is phenomenal news for our state's people and places. But what can we do working with our policymakers to better support this growth and sustain it for the future? Our speakers for today will seek to answer that very question. We're excited to kick off today's webinar with Mike Ariola, Director of the SBA North Carolina District Office. And joining us later is <clears throat> Representative Robert Reeves and Senator Todd Johnson, who will all discuss what policymakers at both the state and federal levels can do to ensure the viability of the small business ecosystem moving forward. Our speakers will also talk about the resources available from both levels and the policy opportunities being discussed to support North Carolina small businesses. Following both the presentation from Mike and panel discussion with Senator Johnson and Representative Reeves, there will be time for you to submit your questions via the live Q&A feature, and we will also address a few of your questions that were pre-submitted. We recognize that everyone's time is valuable, and we will make every attempt to end on time at 11 a.m. Now, before we officially get started, I'll take just a moment to review a few housekeeping items. Please note that all participants are muted, except for speakers and presenters, of course. We do, however, want you to give you the chance to engage with our expert panelists. You can do so via the Zoom Q&A feature. If you're using the call-in option, you can email your questions to events at ncruralcenter.org. Also, today's webinar will be recorded and made available to you in the coming days. We'd also like for you to continue today's conversation on Twitter. Be sure to follow and tag at NC Rural Center and at Rural Counts and use the hashtag Small Business Week. Now, let's welcome our first presenter, Mike Ariola, SBA North Carolina District Director. Mike leads an office that drives economic development by assisting local entrepreneurs with starting and growing their businesses. He also directs the implementation of SBA programs related to accessing capital, business advising, and government contracts. Without further ado, let's get started. Mike, the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much, Brandy. And it's great to be here in North Carolina and happy Small Business Week to all. For over 50 years, the SBA has been celebrating National Small Business Week as a means of recognizing the contributions and accomplishments of our small business owners like you, because we recognize that the small businesses you all create not just provide for your own livelihood and your own living, but they also provide for the livelihood of all of your employees. And they also definitely have ripple effects and very positive outcomes for the broader community as well. Uh, so happy Small Business Week to all. And my thanks to Miles and Brandy and the gang over at the North Carolina Rural Center for having me. Yeah, I'm Mike Ariola. I am the district director of the Small Business Administration. I'm based here in Charlotte. 
And I'm going to cover a couple of different things today. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the SBA's presence in North Carolina. I'm going to cover a couple of recent developments that are of importance to rural North Carolina small businesses, as well as small businesses across the state. I'm going to talk about our major policy initiative for the SBA. I'm going to talk about some of the tools in the SBA's toolkit to help small businesses. And then I'll open it up to questions. As I mentioned, the S I'm located in Charlotte and the district office of the SBA is located in Charlotte. We have about seven or eight folks uh, here in the district office and that's complemented by our one person offices in key three areas of the state. We have Sharon Harvey who handles Western North Carolina based in Asheville. We have Patrick Rodriguez up in Raleigh serving that part of the state. And we have a Wilmington senior area manager office that currently is vacant, but all told we have three satellite offices plus the district office in Charlotte. I'd like to do a quick recap of what we've been doing the last two years with COVID relief funds, because this I think over the last two years uh, has gotten a lot of attention. Uh, and I'm very pleased and proud to let you all know that over the last two years since the start of the pandemic, the SBA has been working hard to deliver $27 billion in capital in all its COVID relief forms to over 500,000 small businesses and certain eligible nonprofits across the state of North Carolina. We deliver PPP loans in partnership with our lenders. Those are 100% forgivable loans. Uh, we are wrapping up the processing of our direct economic injury disaster loans for COVID relief. Our advanced programs, free money up to $10,000, uh, totaled about $600,000. Uh, our shuttered venue operators grant helped live performance venues and other uh, venue operators stay in, businesses, in business to the tune of about $286 million. And finally, our restaurant revitalization fund, which was exhausted very, very fast, uh, helped almost 3,000 restaurants and food service and industries across the state. But in the midst of this pandemic, and I'm just gonna repeat Brandy's talking points, phenomenally, uh, it's just amazing that the state of North Carolina recorded an increase, a, a record increase in the number of new business filings in 2021, uh, 178,300. And that was a 40% increase over what was already a record in 2020. So, uh, and this just keeps happening. Um, I'm in touch with Tim Crowley over at Secretary of State Elaine Marshall's office and his current stats tell me that for the first quarter of 2022, that is from January through March of 2022, news, new business filings are up at 47,000. That eclipsed last year's record of 45,000 and the year before it was only 20 some thousand. So we're talking about an 80% increase in new business filings during that two year period, which is just phenomenal. So that shows everybody that while uh, the effects of the pandemic did require um, the federal government to step in with all of its various COVID relief programs, particularly last year, we, we saw some phenomenal, spectacular growth in new business filings uh, as well. So it wasn't just help, we need money. There were also some very strong signs of, uh, of risk economic activity in the way of new business filings. At the same time, as we saw that record in new business filings, the SBA itself, for the first time, exceeded $1 billion in our traditional programs. So the 7A loan program, the 504 loan program to help small businesses start, develop, and succeed and add you know, capital expenditures, those programs recorded a record over $1 billion for the first time. So that's a very, very bright sign. And if you take a look at the uh, percentage growth, yep, the growth was pretty clear in terms of uh, the number of loans given and the dollars funded. Let me say a word, or actually, let me just repeat the words of Secretary Marshall. And I thought this was very much worth repeating. North Carolina is a hotbed of folks eager and willing to make their own way no matter what the pandemic throws their way. And frankly, I could not have said it any better than Secretary Marshall. And in my social media feeds, you know, over the last year or so, I've been getting, you know, articles and announcements about the great resignation. I like to think of it as the great startup. Um, to be sure, there is some correlation between 
folks that are resigning from their jobs to go and start businesses. I can tell you that anecdotally, that is true from what I'm hearing from some of our resource partners, but I prefer to think of it, like I said, as the great startup, an opportunity for our small businesses here in North Carolina to further start up and expand in business. And the most important message I wanted to leave with folks is that SBA and our resource partners, for sure, we're firmly committed to serve you and to help you get equipped with the tools, resources, and hopefully the capital that you all need to start, develop, and succeed. One of the major policy initiatives for the SBA that I wanted to touch on has to do with the equity action plan uh, that's been promoted by the administration and that the SBA itself is also certainly lending a hand to, to participate in. And it has to do with ensuring equitable access to the SBA's programs and services for, folk, for folks that have been traditionally underserved. And to the extent that I, as your district director for the state of North Carolina, can lend a hand and to ensure that our underserved audiences have fair and equitable access to our loan programs, to our counseling and training programs, you have my commitment that the SBA is going to be doing that. So who are our underserved audiences? Top of mind are our rural communities. I think by last count, uh, I believe the rural center counts 78 of our 100 counties as being rural. Uh, so geographically, that is most of our state. And there are tons of small businesses that are in need of capital, as well as counseling and training assistance. Uh, our underserved audiences also include minorities, women, LGBTQ plus folks, and others as well. Um, so to the extent that I can help with deploying our SBA programs uh, to serve these communities with greater intentional, intentionality, I certainly intend to do that. So what does the SBA have to bring to the table exactly? There are four major program areas that the SBA has available. One is small business loans. We do have a number of certification programs that can help small businesses tap into the very lucrative federal contracting marketplace. Disaster assistance uh, continues to be a part of the SBA's uh, tool chest in terms of helping small businesses and others uh, recover from natural disaster and stay resilient. And finally, there is our suite of counseling and training programs available to help all of our folks here in North Carolina. We have the SBA's guaranteed loans, which work in partnership with banks, credit unions, and other lenders uh, for folks willing to start, develop, and succeed. We have 504 loans that are fixed asset loans. So if folks are wanting to buy a building, buy a large piece of machinery, by the building that they currently rent from a landlord to make them an offer. The 504 loan program uh, will be a great fit for you. And our economic development friends love the 504 loan program because there's actually a job creation component to it. So it's a very important device to help our economies uh, and our local community, communities uh, develop economically. And finally, there are SBA microloans uh, that are available for folks. Um, in in Western North Carolina, there's Mountain BizWorks, which is an SBA micro lender. And very recently up in y'all's area, there around the triangle, we recently signed up Carolina Community Impact. So we're very excited to have them come on board. And shortly, they're gonna be able to do SBA micro loans up in that part of the state. And there are links that I provided to everybody in case they wanted to find out how to apply for these loans. Your rule of thumb really is to go to wherever you have your bank accounts. But we realize that not everybody um, you know, deals tr with traditional banks. So we do have the lender match tool where folks can go online, indicate how much do they want, what they need it for, where they're located. And when they click send, every lender that has opted in, bank, credit union, FinTech, will reply back and say, yeah, we're interested. We'd like to talk to this person. And we also have a list of lenders serving the state of North Carolina at our website. Federal procurement is another program that the SBA has available to assist our rural and other small businesses here in North Carolina. And here's the thing about doing business with the federal government. The federal government spends upwards of $800 billion a year for goods and services of all kinds. Think of what it takes to run the entirety of Fort Bragg. They need tons of support services in addition to armaments and um, munitions and that sort of thing. Within the Small Business Act, 23 cents out of every federal contracting dollar 
uh, are supposed to go to small businesses. And we have certification programs that can ensure a more direct pipeline into those dollars. Top of mind is the SBA 8A program for socially and, socially and economically disadvantaged individuals that can enable them to get a foothold into, into federal contracting. There's also the historically underutilized business zones program, which is different from the North Carolina hub program. The hub zone program looks at where your business is located and where your folks live who are employed. And it's all by geographic area based on census tract data that determine whether or not a given locale is economically distressed. And the whole premise behind the hub zone program is to award federal contracting opportunities to these small businesses and their workers who are located in distressed communities as a means of economically fortifying those areas. There is the women-owned small business program for women-owned firms doing business with the federal government. And finally, there is the service disabled veteran-owned program. And those percentages you see in, percent in parentheses, those reflect the percentage of those awards of total federal contracting that are targeted to go to 8A firms, hub zone firms, et cetera. So just a moment ago, when I said 23 cents out of every federal contracting dollar is supposed to go to small businesses, well, 3% are supposed to get, is supposed to go to 8A businesses. Uh, Women-owned small businesses are supposed to get 5% of the total as well. So that's how the federal contracting universe works. And if you are doing business with the federal government and you are an 8A firm that happens to also be hub zone certified, that is also women-owned small business certified, and that is also service disabled veteran owned program certified, these folks actually exist because I've met them, then you're like the holy grail in federal contracting because you enable federal contracting officers to realize their procurement goals by marking off every one of these boxes. So it's certainly to everybody's advantage to get as many of these certifications or designations as possible. Doing business with the federal government is not for the faint of heart because it does require knowledge of the federal acquisition regulation, and it does require a knack for the paperwork requirements of doing business with the government. But it can be a very, very rewarding, monetarily and otherwise, line of business for your firm. Disaster assistance continues to be of help to our, our small businesses, as well as homeowners here in the state of North Carolina. And I think most, if not, not, if not all of our folks are aware that SBA disaster, disaster uh, loan officers come through the state whenever there's you know, a hurricane uh, down on the coast, when there's flooding up in the mountains, when there's you know, inclement weather somewhere in between. So that part of the program is still very much active in the event of a natural disaster. And finally, the SBA has a host of counseling and training programs. We do a bit of counseling and training ourselves at the SBA, but it's usually geared toward accessing SBA loans and federal contracting programs that we have. For general counseling purposes, and you can see these folks, you know, whether you're looking to start a business or whether you're looking to expand or even exit your business. We have five program areas, and then there's a sixth one that I think deserves special mention. Uh, we have the SBTDC, uh, which is the Small Business and Technology Development Center. They're sort of a joint venture between the SBA and the University of North Carolina system. There are 15 centers of the SBTDC across the state of North Carolina staffed with full-time counselors that can help you um, throughout the lifetime of your business. They also have specialty areas of assistance, I might add. So if you have a specific interest in doing business with the government, if you have a specific interest in commercializing technology, you know, you've got an invention or a patent that you want to bring to market. Um, if you're interested in, in looking into foreign markets with exporting and international trade, those are some of the areas of specialty that the SBTDC has to offer. We also have nine chapters of SCORE across the state. And SCORE is our volunteer network of mentors, men and women, both retired and active in, in, in business. Uh, that are willing and able to help small businesses throughout the life of their business as well. We do have the One Veterans Business Outreach Center over at Fayetteville State University to help our veteran population. And we have five women's business centers across the state of North Carolina in Charlotte, Fayetteville, Asheville, 
Raleigh-Durham and at Winston-Salem State University. There is a new program, which, uh, pardon me, but I forget, forgot to add their logo. This is the SBA Community Navigator Program. Uh, it's a brand new program made available by the um, American Re uh, Recovery Program Act, ARPA. Um, and how the Community Navigator Program is the SBA awards funding to nonprofit navigators so that they can reach out to underserved communities and connect them with the tools and resources that they need to, to, um, to grow and succeed in business. And our sole community navigator hub for the state of North Carolina is Forward Cities, serving the city and county of Durham. And they use six spokes to reach out to these underserved communities and better acquaint them with the tools that they need to be successful. Um, finally, one of the programs that is not SBA affiliated or sponsored, but is very, very important to those of us in the state of North Carolina is our vast network of small business centers affiliated with the community college system. I believe there are 58 small business centers across the state of North Carolina. So typically, not always, but typically wherever there is a community college campus, you will find a small business center. And they have folks there that can also assist um, with your business related questions. Um, and they know who all of the players are in this small business ecosystem. So if they don't have the answer, they'll be sure to refer them to one of our partners as well. So there's no shortage of very important resources for folks to get assistance. If they just kind of need some direction in terms of what's out there, what are the best fits for their business? These are the folks you all need to see. And I provided links there for SBA local assistance, as well as the North Carolina Community College Small Business Center Network. So with that, I want to thank everybody for joining us. I'll make sure that folks have our contact details um, after this session. And uh, I'll turn it back to Brandy or Jen. Thank you so much, Mike. That was a, a wealth of information. We definitely saw some conversation in the chat. Thank you for all those resources that folks really want to share out with their network. So thank you so much for that. I uh, just want to do a little Q&A with you. I know you have to hop off around 1030, but thank you so much for your time you've spent with us today. And, and again, everything that you shared, just a few questions. So can you walk us through the SBA's response to the COVID-19 pandemic and how that shifted as a pandemic has shifted over time and, and where and how you see that moving forward and, and particularly any lessons learned? So it's like a four part question. Okay. So walk okay. us through what you did and what's happening now and how you see that changing over time and any lessons yeah. learned from you all's work. Yeah, yeah, great question, because, you know, in many ways, the pandemic is just not over. But, you know, many of our COVID relief programs are over. Um, let's start with the PPP loan program. And this was a, a nifty little way for the government to get the money out as soon as possible. So the SBA already has a network of lenders through our traditional 7A guarantee program. So what the federal, what your federal government did is they said, well, we know that people need money right away. You know, the Treasury Department can't print checks and, you know, deposit funds quickly enough. So we do have this vast network of lenders. Let's use them and let's sign up as many more lenders as possible. And we'll provide this funding in the way of a loan, 100% guaranteed by the SBA. So if anything goes wrong, these lenders know that the SBA will step forward and make good on that guarantee and pay up. But we'll also say, Provided you use this loan for specific purposes, chiefly, but not only payroll, you can get that loan fully forgiven. And so that was the federal government's response to get the money out as quickly as possible in order basically, but not only to save jobs. And that's why it's called the Paycheck, uh, the, the paycheck Protection Program. It's to save everybody's paychecks to keep them um, gainfully employed. So that's how that started. Um, and that's how that was implemented. And now we're going through the process of getting those, those loans forgiven. Um, I think the big takeaway there is using our network of lenders was a very efficient way you know, to get the money out there quickly. It that happened much quicker than if the federal government itself tried to you know, figure out you know, what's their account numbers, you know, where do I mail the check? Just use the network of financial institutions. They're already out there. Um, so that was a very good positive takeaway. Um, then there was the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, which is the direct loan program from the SBA. IDLs, as they're called, 
have been available to help folks recover um, in the aftermath of natural disasters. So, you know, whenever we've had a hurricane, not only are there physical disaster loans available to help rebuild a house or whatever, there are also economic injury disaster loans to help with businesses with working capital. So that idol has always been in place. We just made sure that there was a, a portion of it reserved for COVID recovery, because in this case, the disaster is not natural, it's COVID pandemic related. And so that, was, um, that didn't require much regulatory help. It was just a matter of shifting uh, kind of like the attention, if I can put it that way, of the SBA from its physical disaster um, focus to the COVID relief part. Um, the big challenge there was um, the, the bandwidth of the SBA and, you know, just the huge demand. I mean, when you have thousands of banks out there with thousands of bankers to help all these millions of small businesses, um, there's a pretty sure bandwidth there to help when you're foisting the same volume of activity on SBA's small staff, it's a much heavier lift. So we had to staff up very, very quickly to make sure that folks um, you know, do get the, the service that they, that they deserve and that they need. Um, that is what we saw with the economic injury disaster loan. Um, I frankly am still not satisfied with the level of service that all of our uh, COVID disaster relief customers are getting. And so our team is also jumping in, jumping in to help uh, wherever we can. The local offices like ours do not process these, these idols, but we have some visibility into their records. And if they're just not, if the customer is just not getting to the bottom of why exactly, what exactly do I need to do to get this, uh, this going, then they, they are calling the district office and we're happy to help to the extent that we can. But that I think was, is one lesson and that, that is, you know, our district office has been more than happy to help our folks that are still struggling. Um, with the advanced programs, um, uh, those of course are by congressional mandate. I mean, whatever Congress says is available is what we're gonna make available. I do wanna say something about the restaurant revitalization fund because that went, went by so fast. I think everybody in America knew that what was budgeted was just not enough. By some measures, there were some estimates of like 250, is that too much? 250 billion, I think is, that might be a little bit too much. Maybe it's 250,000 small businesses may have needed that, but whatever the, whatever the, the figure was, what was provided was just not enough. Um, uh, it, that is a matter for our lawmakers to consider. Um, you know, if there are still folks that are struggling out there that need more, um, I'll leave it in the in the hands of our small business stakeholders, yeah. Um, yeah. because SBA SBA can't lobby. I mean, it's illegal for me to lobby members of Congress. Right, right. Uh, we have a couple uh, questions in the chat that I definitely want to ensure that we get to before you have to hop off, Mike. And again, thank you for your time with us today. Um, you mentioned during your presentation the SBA's equity action plan. And can you talk a little bit about the outreach strategies that you all have engaged or employed rather to meet the needs of underserved entrepreneurs? Like you identify rural communities, women, the LGBTQI plus community as well. And so what strategies have you all employed and what's worked and maybe what are you trying to tweak? Yeah, what we're, what we're trying to do with a lot more intentionality is to partner with organizations uh, that already know our underserved audiences. Um, a good partner of ours, for example, is Tammy Hall over with the North Carolina Department of, of Administration Hub Program, and now also the Minority Business Development Association. So we've been partnering with Tammy and their folks throughout the entire pandemic to let them, folk, to let them know, hey, this is the latest on IDLE, this is the latest on PPP. So we've already got that very strong relationship. Transitioning post COVID, now the task is, is for us to sort of rekindle that relationship, but focus more on the positive traditional growth trajectory that we see our state going on. So Tammy's, Tammy's group will be one, but there are many others. There are LGBT chambers that we know um, very well here in the state of North Carolina. Uh, there are Asian American uh, and Pacific Islander uh, groups and business associations that we can reach out to with a lot more of a sustained effort. There are African-American chambers. You know, in the course of the pandemic, I teamed up with folks that were representing the Divine Nine and folks that are representing the, the African-American Engineers Association too. So I've got those ties. It's just a matter of transitioning them from 
pandemic COVID related relief stuff to educating folks more about the traditional, the other stuff that we have to help these small businesses. And then finally, searching out um, other audiences that maybe we need to pay a lot more attention to. Um, you know, I do know that there are many uh, tribal organizations and I do know Greg Richardson with uh, the North Carolina state government uh, that I've been talking to. So we expect to do a more robust outreach uh, program with those folks because first and foremost, I'm talking about outreach a lot because there is still a bit of a mystique about the SBA. A lot of folks out there kind of have heard of SBA. They don't know quite what we do. They don't know quite know how we can be of help. Through presentations like this, our hope is, and our expectation is that folks will be a lot more familiar with what we have to provide and how that can address their specific needs so that they can grow, develop, and succeed. Awesome. And just one last question, Mike. Um, so just leaving us with, are there any pressing resources or updates that you wanna share with our call, particularly ones that obviously will benefit entrepreneurs and small business owners, what should we be aware of moving forward that SBA will be working on or has to offer bring to bear? I think the best rule of thumb is to stay in touch not only with the SBA, but also with our resource partners. So visit us at sba.gov slash NC, sign up for our newsletters. And if you really want to be savvy about it, all those resource partners that I talked about, SBTDC, SCORE, the Women's Business Center, VBOC, and your local small business center, sign up for their, their newsletters as well, because there's a wealth of information, a wealth of activities and events going on that you all really need to be aware of if you're in business or if you're looking to start a business, because there's, there's offerings of all kinds from QuickBooks to the fabulous annual women's conferences that go on through all five of our women's centers. So um, stay in the know, stay in touch, and um, whatever's coming up, you'll be sure to learn about it. Thank you for that, Mike. We do know we also have a number of those resource providers probably on today's call. So we'll probably mm -hmm. kind of compile a compendium of those resources and share it back out with our attendees. So Mike, thank you again so much for a very informative presentation and discussion. And thanks also for everything you do for the great state of North Carolina. Happy to do it. Good to be with you. Happy Small Business Week, y'all. Same to Go you. Go out and build back better with entrepreneurship. That's our thing. Build back better with entrepreneurship. Take care, y'all. Thank you, Mike. Have a great day. You, you as well. Awesome. Great conversation with Mike. Uh, thanks him again for, uh, for joining us today. Now we'll transition to an in-depth discussion with two of our state's most dedicated policymakers. They are here today to share with us their perspective on state level policy opportunities of the past, the present, and the future. It is my pleasure to welcome Senator Todd Johnson and Representative Robert Reeves. Uh, Senator Todd Johnson represents District 35, which covers Union County. Senator Johnson was elected to the state uh, Senate in November 2018 after serving as a Union County Commissioner from 2010 to 2014. In addition to his time at the North Carolina General Assembly, Senator Johnson has helped grow his family's insurance business and serves on numerous boards and commissions at the state and local levels. Next up, Representative Robert Reed II represents District 54, which covers Chatham and Durham counties. Representative Reeves is the Democratic leader of the House and has served in the State House of Representatives since 2014. In addition to his legislative role, he has been a partner in the law firm of Wilson and Reeves for almost two decades. Representative Reeves continues his service to his community outside of the General Assembly as a board member of several local and statewide organizations. Thank you for joining us today, Senator Johnson and Representative Reeves. We are glad that you're with us. Glad to be here. Thanks for having us. Of course, of course. Um, so to kick off today's discussion, we wanna give you a few moments to share maybe some highlights of your thoughts regarding this fall business ecosystem in North Carolina, work that you are inspired to do to support the ecosystem and to grow the viability of our entrepreneurs across the state. So I'll start with you, Representative Reeves. Well, I think the thing that I was happiest about is, you know, with us going through the pandemic and the circumstances that we did is how we were able to come together to really support our businesses a lot through financing. And, um, you know, for one of those being the, uh, you know, obviously the PPP loans, which originated from the federal dollars. But of course, we were able to help distribute and give some relief from um, at the state level. And that 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 to me was powerful because obviously when we went into the pandemic, nobody knew what it was going to look like going forward. 
And so to be able to get that out of the way early, um, not wait until businesses were failing um, meant a lot. And then as we were coming out of the pandemic to be able to work with businesses to try to help them return safely to uh, their work and to really uh, take care of their employees, but also be able to take care of their bottom line because uh, small businesses, obviously the backbone of North Carolina and the last thing that you want to have are businesses closing down and not opening back up. Um, you know, some of the things we're able to do just for the hospitality industry, restaurants, bars, things of that sort. I mean, we just really, I think, came together as a group and a unit to make sure that these folks were able to keep the doors open. Great, thank you, Representative Breeze. Senator Johnson? And again, thanks for having us here today. And uh, good to see you, uh, Representative Reeves. It's been a little while. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> in addition to uh, the the funding that Representative Reeves mentioned, I think another piece that was very big for these small businesses was the ability to get funding into our school system so that parents could go back to work and the employees. Because uh, with employers, a lot of my personal employee employees are are parents and they've got kids in school age kids. And so it was very difficult for them to, uh, to be able to come to work and also take care of their family. And our motto here is family first. And so having the funds get, uh, to be able to get that back into the school so that, uh, that they could have the COVID protections and the different uh, things that they needed so that kids could go to, to school uh, safely and teachers could teach safely and, and being able to get those folks back in the school so that the, their parents could get back to work uh, which was important to them as well, as well as the small business uh, owner. So uh, a lot of good things came down. The federal government did give us a, uh, a lot of the funding, which uh, I think the state did a very good job um, in the leadership in both chambers, uh, Representative Reeves, uh, Speaker Moore on the House side and Senator Berger on our side and Senator Blue did a great job of, of facilitating that out to get that, that money released. Now, was it perfect? Absolutely not. I mean, it, it's a big albatross of a, of a government uh, that's not very nimble, but I think with the time constraints that we had, uh, it, was, it was done as, as well as could be expected. Thank you. Thank you both for that. And just pivoting just a little bit, not obviously off topic, but um, during our last webinar that took place on Monday, we heard from the Secretary of State's office who presented data on the recent findings that over 300,000 new businesses have been created since the onset of the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic. How have you seen evidence of this boom in small businesses in your districts? I'll let whoever feels comfortable jumping in first. Sure, I, I don't mind jumping in. Uh, at least here in Union County, uh, what we have is a lot of a lot of small businesses that are thriving. We're, we're a bedroom community for Charlotte, and so once you you've seen this inflow of federal dollars, uh, that you know a lot of the major corporations. Uh, took advantage of that and that was great for them. But with the downstream revenue aspect, the supporting small businesses that help support supplies and, and construction and, and expansion of these businesses, we've seen that here in Union County where um, these, these dollars were put into place so that the small businesses would have an opportunity to support the supply chains. And it's been very beneficial to us here. I mean, we see it on the ground and uh, things are booming around here for sure. Representative Reeves? Yeah, and I think with uh, Chatham and Durham, what we've seen is innovation. I mean, it's, it's really been cool to watch people as they've figured out what the new ecosystem looks like and how to adapt. And so, um, and, and you know, and the, the sad part in some senses, but the good part in the sense of creating business is you had people who, because, um, you know, businesses were closed and things of that sort or lost opportunities, they were able to look and find things that they really love to do and then create businesses that were reflected that. And I really think that I, I'm a firm believer that if you got something that you love, you can make money doing it. And so I love to see people be able to get that opportunity. And they did have that opportunity during the pandemic to really reevaluate. You've seen people uh, work more towards um, jobs that allow them flexibility, not necessarily just staying at home, but the flexibility to be with family, to, uh, to, to enjoy life. Uh, you know, it's good to make money. But it's also good to be able to enjoy the money that you make and uh, so I've, I've really enjoyed the innovation that I've seen and I've seen people adapt in ways that I think not only I wouldn't have expected but um, just really would not have seen if not for what we went through with the pandemic. I think that's a great uh, great response of course and definitely I think a question that we want I want to tag on to that 
um, which is around incentivizing uh, additional small business creation and growth. You know, what are y'all's thoughts and perspectives on what that can look like from our policy perspective? So we see that there are huge incentives for larger businesses, you know, that to come to North Carolina and grow their businesses. What are you all thinking could be possible in North Carolina to support the small business in doing the same? Well, I think definitely one of the things we've got to do is invest in workforce. Um, and, and that that is is kind of a you've got to take a holistic response when it comes to that. We've been really lucky in my area. Again, Chatham, Durham used to serve Chat and you serve Lee County. Also, Lee County has really seen a boom. But what you've seen all together uh, with these companies is that they're coming in. Um, the big companies, but the small businesses are building around them. All of them say the same thing is that they've got great jobs. They've got great money that they can pay people, but they need to be have people that can do the basic jobs. We're lucky to have a Central, um, Central Carolina Community College and a system that can train, but we've got to get people in that door. We've got to make sure that people know about the opportunities. That, that's one of the things that you never think about is the marketing of the opportunities because people can go out and seek work all day, but some of these jobs they've not heard of and don't even know are available. So we've got to make sure that we're investing in workforce, investing in education, especially, you know, obviously K through 12, because they've got to have a basic foundation, but also in our higher education, especially our community colleges, but then making sure that we market to people that these jobs are out there and continue to work on uh, helping small businesses, especially with health care. Uh, the, the one thing that I, I own a small business, and so I understand that too, but you know, one of the things that you see with a lot of businesses that they discuss is it's really hard for a small business to keep up with the larger businesses when it comes to healthcare. So doing things that help them balance that out, help them lower their healthcare costs on jobs so that they can keep quality employees, but at the same time, not have those employees miss benefits that they would get with larger companies. Senator Johnson? Yeah, and, and uh, Representative Reeves, in uh, in typical fashion, is is very smart, and he knows exactly uh, what I was thinking. But uh, community college system in North Carolina, I had the privilege of serving on that state board for four years. We call it the Great Fifty Eight for a reason. We have uh, recently um, the, the national publication put out the top ten community colleges in the country. North Carolina had seven of them, and, and it's truly an opportunity that I, I think gets forgotten. A lot, but a trained workforce is the centerpiece. Uh, but have, uh, job creation, small business creation, and having the skill set to, to do these jobs because it's not like 20 and 30 years ago. The skills that are required for some of these jobs now take that additional training. And, and with that, we have the, a system that's set up. Uh, we, we invest in this. I personally don't think we invest enough in the community college system, but we do invest in a system that has zero barriers to entry. That's our goal with the community college system here in North Carolina, zero barriers to entry. So if, uh, if money's an issue, we'll take care of it. If, if a uh, time or, or you have another job that you're trying to work, there's flexibility uh, to be able to take night classes and stuff like that. And I know we're not just talking about education, but I truly think, that small business, the incentive for small businesses and for folks to want to locate here to North Carolina, a lot of that can, uh, is uh, hinges on the, uh, the community college system and the trained workforce that uh, Representative Reeves mentioned. It's, uh, it's simply one of the gem gems of North Carolina that uh, hopefully we can continue to, to reach out to folks and, and get involved in our high schools so these, uh, these folks know that it's coming and that it's available uh, with career coaches, et cetera. So, uh, it's a great gem for North Carolina, and hopefully we can continue to grow that. Yes, thank you. Thank you both for that. And now you both alluded to, I think, the, the foundation that our community college system and just education, I think, generally um, puts forth and brings to bear for all North Carolinians. Uh, in that regard, we know that we also have a robust small business ecosystem of resource providers that support, I think, growing and sustaining uh, small businesses across the state. Um, and so with that, what are your thoughts on kind of additional ways to support the small business ecosystem specifically? You know, for example, uh, the small business center networks at the 58 community colleges across the state and the state office as well. I 
let you start, Senator Johnson, since okay. I started the last one. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. No, uh, a lot of times the the knowledge of having of the of these programs that are available to to the to our citizens is just not there. And I know I've spoken with folks with the rural center. They come to our office often, and we talk about how do we get this message out and and the the tools that are available. So I think having having a statewide push and 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 being able to to make sure that folks know that these networks are available is very is very important because. Uh, I hate to use this term, but there's money being left on the table that's there and available for them to, to help get the, the jump start needed. Also, uh, in addition, and, and maybe I should have mentioned this in the previous question, but looking at uh, what I've seen at least in the last three years or three and a half years now of being in the legislature is working to reduce some of these state and local uh, regulations. I know that we, uh, we were actually personally opening a business uh, I guess two and a half, three years ago locally, and we got mired in the in the local zoning and the building codes and stuff like that. And we ended up delaying the project from opening for nine months. And so some of the legislation that I've worked on is trying to work uh, to streamline the building code process so folks can get in there and, and open their business because truly time is money. And uh, so some of the changes we've been able to make there, I think have, have helped as well. So both a state and a local uh, initiative has to be done and it has to be made for these things to, to come to fruition. Thank you. Representative Reeves? Completely agree with those points and, uh, and, and definitely think that we've got to make sure people know what's out there. And, and it gets back to my earlier point about marketing because that, that's the surprising part is that there's so much out here to support these businesses and people just don't know about it. And, and they need this help. I mean, if you've run a small business or, or especially if you started a small business, you know, it is uh, can be pretty overwhelming. And to have somebody there that can show you the ropes to hold your hand through certain issues and to help you, especially like Senator Johnson was talking about through a lot of the building codes, things that sort you've got to go through. That's that's key. Another thing we've got to do is we've got to address housing. Uh, it, it is a shocking thing for those of us uh, that grew up in a rural area. You know, I grew up in a rural area um, and, it, you know, you never think about not being able to afford a home. But we're now at a point now that if you're a CEO moving to North Carolina, it's a great time because we've got builders who will build you the greatest mansions and homes that you ever want. But if you're a regular Joe working a good job that can put you know, food on your table and take care of your family, it's really, really tough to get a home. And so we've got to figure out some innovative ways to address the homing crisis, the housing crisis, because, it, you know, there was a report just came out recently that Wake County, for instance, has become the second most expensive market um, in the nation behind St. Louis, Missouri. And so and what it means by that is average wage compared to average housing price and so a home price. So I think we've got to figure out some ways to address that. And it's not just for small businesses. I mean, that goes for, um, you know, government employees, things of that sort, because I know if you own a business, it's great for that business owner to know that his or her employees are right there in the community. Um, you, you don't mind having people dropping in, obviously, but you'd love to have people who are part of the community who are right there near their job and who can make it more family atmosphere, because that's really what helps grow your business. But we've got to make it affordable for people to be able to live near these jobs. And that's something we're going to have to figure out a way to address. And you both um, addressed a couple of uh, connected policy issues um, regarding the ability for one to, to grow, to start or even grow a business, which are access to health insurance for the employer themselves or employees and their families, and also obviously access to workforce housing to support the ability of people to live in the communities in which they work. Another issue that's come up, I think, in the chat and on this call, and actually yes, uh, Monday as well, which is uh, issues around that child care crisis. So can you all speak to opportunities you think could uh, be potential solutions to that, either at a state policy level or at a local level as well, to support business growth and development? Well, I think Senator Johnson hit on it perfectly earlier, but it, it is a big deal about what to do with the children. And I think that if we can come up with opportunities and ways, and you've got models that have worked um, in the private sector, you know, I look at the Boys and Girls Club, things of that sort. So, I mean, you've got um, things that have worked, we've got to figure out, you know, there have been uh, tax credits that have been offered at times um, and support for programs to open up, but we've got to figure out something to do when it comes down to childcare, because 
it's a real issue. And what we don't want is, you know, again, when we were growing up, well, at least with Senator Johnson and I were growing up, Brandy, you're a lot younger than that. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> when we were growing up, you know, it was no problem being a latchkey kid, you know, because, you know, you 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 didn't have much else to do but to do your homework and things like that or to play sports or something. But, yeah, now there's so much out there that could send kids the wrong way. You want to have opportunities for them to do things that are productive when they're not with their parents and, and to really be able to mimic some of the uh, good training that they get when they're with their family. So programs that do that benefit us all because, they do, they give the parents a chance to work, they give the kids something productive, and it helps turn the children into really good productive citizens. And, and Representative Reeves hit on a, a, another great point about uh, groups like Boys and Girls Club and different organizations and nonprofits throughout the state. That's why, you know, when you look at a state budget, and uh, you'll see a number of different nonprofits that are being funded in that in that state budget for it. And it's for that reason. It's for the reason that the services that they are able to provide help facilitate uh, the, the state moving forward. And it helps take uh, issues such as child care and being able to make it more affordable for folks and allow them the, the ability to work. Um, this is truly an issue that, uh, that the state struggled with for, for a number of years now. And how do we how do we. Um, not just affordable, but available, because in, in some communities, it's, it's just not even available, much less mm -hmm. affordable. And so having the ability to to provide that care, um, sure, I, you know, I was born and raised in, uh, in a rural, even more rural than the area that I already live in here and now, and child care simply is not available. And, and it's hard to um, it's hard to go to work if you've got a kid at home. And so um, it's a, it's, it's a problem that the, the state has been working on, but we have a long ways to go on it. And hopefully within the next few years, I don't know if you'll ever quote unquote solve it, but if we can keep working toward a solution, I think that's the ultimate goal. And, and one thing I think that's a, a common uh, misconception is that if you get elected to an office, you all of a sudden have all the answers. And I, I know that Representative Reeves would agree with me, but uh, we don't have all the answers. So feedback and, and, and input is always welcomed and appreciated because we're, once you get elected, you're not just, uh, you know, donned with all the information that you need to, to solve these tasks. And that's why I love Senator Johnson, because he's one of the few of us, along with me, that understands that getting elected doesn't mean you have all the answers. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so. Amen to that. <laughs> Well, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. A um, couple more questions that we can get those in before we close out. But um, another sort of policy related question, obviously, you know, what are your legislative priorities that you're hoping to advance in the short term, potentially not in a short session, but in the coming years to make North Carolina a more a small business friendly state for both new business creations and for small business groups? So are there policy priorities that you've identified that you would like to work towards in the next few years? I'll, I'll jump in there if that's okay with you, Representative Reeves. Yes, um, sir. So I think what you've seen, and we've seen it through growth in budgets and, and revenues that the state's been receiving, I think a continued push to reduce the regulations and, and the burden, uh, as I mentioned earlier, even into the building code and the permitting and stuff of that nature, making changes that are smart because we still ultimately, our goal is to protect the consumers of North Carolina to make sure they're in a safe in, uh, environment and make sure that they can be successful. But, but reducing those regulations, both at the state and local level, um, some of us disagree with, uh, with this item and that's okay. But I think the, the tax burden that's on businesses uh, is still plays a big part in the ability to both open uh, grow and employ more folks. And so making sure we continue to reduce the regulations and, and also the taxes on these individuals, uh, small businesses is important. Uh, income tax. So many of your small businesses that we, we refer to, we call them small business, but in, in a lot of cases, they're sole proprietors. They're one, one person or maybe a family that uh, has a business. So uh, personal income tax is important to them as well. And so having the ability to, um, to make sure that we're we're only taking what we really need to, to run the state from from their coffers. I know that uh, one of the things that's been worked on and was started in this last budget was the reduction of the franchise tax, which uh, the, I have a belief in terms of corporate taxes or business taxes that a business tax really does hurt a small business, especially because that's money that they can't pay 
toward expanding or adding a, a new computer or adding another employee or, or building an, a, another addition to their business to grow it that way. So trying to keep those uh, in check. And I think what you've seen over the last number of years uh, is the, the state kind of reducing that. And that's why North Carolina is ranked either one or two in the business friendly states in the country year over year because of our constant attention to that. And so uh, I think it's 2026, we'll, uh, we'll have a reduction in the income tax down to, I think, 3.99 and also uh, hopefully get rid of the, uh, the onerous um, franchise tax that every small business pays, whether you make $1 or not, you're paying those taxes. So uh, continue to uh, look at those and attention to those, I think, is a way to at least help our small businesses. And I would say that uh, I definitely agree with a lot of Senator Johnson's points. I think that a tax burden on small businesses, and it's really interesting because you're, you're correct. When you look at small businesses, we they end up, unfortunately, under our tax code, getting loop, um, kind of pushed in uh, with corporate and other businesses, and they can't yeah, you know, and it's different for them. You know, if you're a billion dollar corporation, your tax savings, you know, tend to go to your shareholders, things of that sort. If you're a small business, your tax savings are getting, going right back into your business because you're still trying to grow it, trying to make it profitable, trying to be able to walk in one day that uh, when the employees get paid, you actually get paid to those kind of things. <laughs> <laughs> so and, uh, that's something we've got to work on. And the other thing is other areas that we can help them reduce expenses, which we already talked about. You know, healthcare is a big deal. Uh, making sure they've got an educated workforce because, you know, that that matters so much. Uh, you know, I've, I've paid more attention to that since I've been in the legislature. And it's just amazing how many good jobs are out there that people just aren't quite qualified for. And, you know, we've got to help businesses do that because, again, a large corporation is no problem. Bring you in. I'll train you. I'll make sure everything that you need is right there. If I'm a small business, the last thing I can do is afford to pay somebody to go learn how to work in my business and then hope and pray that they stay with my business once they learn yeah. how to do those things. <laughs> so it is, uh, you know, th those kind of things are there. And I think that those are opportunities that we have, because again, when you're helping these small businesses, you're building communities. And I, and I know I've mentioned that before, but that's just a really, really big deal to me because I think when you look uh, throughout the state, um, some of your best communities to live in are communities where you know the owners. You know, you know, the people who run your dry cleaner, you know, the people who, you know, run the law office, who run all these other different businesses in town. It's it's just really nice to have. And we've got to make sure that we've got an environment that doesn't just encourage corporates, corporations to get here, but also encourages people to start small businesses. And plus, you know, Jeff Bezos started off in his garage. So who knows? <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's right. One last question. Uh, leave us on this note. So as small business owners yourselves, is there any advice that you would share with new entrepreneurs or those seeking to grow their business in North Carolina? Any unique opportunities or challenge that you would give some good advice around? I think with me, my, my biggest advice is surround yourself by good people, with good people, and, and don't be afraid to pay good people. And, and I'll tell you that, I mean, that was just something I had to uh, learn and recognize. And it's scary when you're going out there on your own and you're always trying to watch every dollar. But what I can tell you is that, you know, we've been lucky. I joined with uh, my law partner. We've got a couple other partners now, but his first two hires stayed with the business. And, and they are people that people still look to right now. I mean, we've been operating for about 45 years now. And they still look for uh, the same legal assistant, you know, to still look for the same paralegal. And, and that, that makes a difference because the other thing that it does is it creates a good atmosphere at work. And I, I think ultimately what my point would be is what my theme has been is quality of life matters. And you make all the money in the world, but if you've got employees coming in and out, you know, that money that you're saving by, you know, paying them less or, you know, whatever it is that's going, it's just not going to be worth it in the end. What matters in the end is that you've built a business that you can be proud of, uh, that you're proud of the people that work there and you're proud of the product that you produce. So I would just say just invest in people. Thank you, Representative Reeves. Senator Johnson, last word. Yeah, couldn't, couldn't agree more, uh, Representative Reeves. You know, pay, making sure your employees understand that uh, they're appreciated and valued. Uh, sure, a great paycheck. Uh, goes a long way with that, but also uh, encouraging them along the way. 
uh, one thing that I've noticed in my in my business as we've been able to take a small mom and pop insurance office and grow it to to where we are today, and we're still small in the grand scheme of things. But uh, but the our customers they know my employees better than they know me, so they come to work. You know, they come to do business with our employees more so than they come to do work with me. So keeping that in mind and, and making sure you understand they're the face of they're the face of your company. And, and so hiring quality people, paying them to make sure that they um, that they want to represent you and be a part of your business. And, and we treat them like family. And, and that's always a good thing. But but also understanding um I know for, for my business, uh, my business has my last name. And so my dad started this business back in 1991. And the name of our company is Johnson Insurance. And so I remember asking my dad at a young age, I said, Dad, why do you, uh, why, why did, would you pick a name that had our, or why did you pick a business name that had our personal name? And he said, because I wanted you to always remember, and I wanted everybody to always remember that when we do business, you're representing this family. And so we will conduct business in a way that is reflective of our family. And so uh, that's all I've always remembered that. And we try to try to operate uh, accordingly with that. But uh, right now in 2022, May, uh, this is a great time in North to be in North Carolina. There are many states that would love to be in the position that North Carolina is in. We are ripe for uh, for growth of small business and entrepreneurs here, and uh, so hopefully we can continue to get the message out, let folks know what services we have available, and always continue to be uh, competitive in the in the national and international arena for these small businesses to open and, and call North Carolina home been truly a privilege to be here with you and uh, hopefully you'll have uh, me and uh, Robert come back to you some other time in the future. Oh, we definitely will. Thank you. So that's recorded. So I'm going to keep you, keep your name to that. Senator Johnson. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but special thanks to you both for sharing your valuable per perspectives and your time with us today. More importantly, for all that you do for the great state of North Carolina. Thank you all so very much. And now we'll transition to close. Um, I'll provide a tour. will provide a couple of closing remarks for us. She is our policy and government affairs manager. She's our key person who keeps track of all things down on Jones Street, and she does so much more. So take us on home, Tori. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Brandy, and thank you, Representative and Senator. Um, so everyone, be sure to sign up for all things North Carolina Rural Center, especially our Rural Counts Advocacy Program legislative updates. I want to remind everyone about the NC Rural Center's Small Business Coalition on our Small Business Coalition is over 400 members and growing. Uh, we represent a diverse and growing consortium of small business owners, support providers, nonprofits, local governments, chambers of commerce, and many more entrepreneurship advocates and champions across the state. Uh, coalition members have the opportunity to engage with policymakers, participate in exploratory research that will inform policy development and positioning, and be a part of advocacy, networking, and capacity building. If you're interested in joining this free coalition, I encourage you to visit our website at ncruralcenter.org or reach out to Brandy, myself, or Miles Kirksey after this call. And with that, thank you to everyone, speakers and guests for participating in today's session and for all that you do in our state, our communities, and for the people of North Carolina. Thank you again and have a great rest of your small business week. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Good to see you.